That's one of them that everybody knows and hardly nobody practices. Proverbs chapter 11, and I want to show you a verse of Scripture here in the Bible. And then I want to give you a thought. I don't even really have a title tonight, but I do have a thought. I guess the last part of this verse would be the title of the message. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30. It says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. The last part of that verse, He that winneth souls is wise. According to that tonight, they really ain't a whole lot of wise people in the world. Some form of invitation for somebody to get saved ought to be given by every person in this room. Everyone. We, every one of us, ought to be involved somehow in trying to get somebody saved. He that winneth souls is wise. I'll never forget the first time I ever heard somebody teach a class on soul winning. Exactly how to set somebody down, tell them how to get saved, and lead them to the Lord. It was in Asheville. And I went over to church in Asheville one morning. It's been, Lord in mercy, long, long time ago. Um, uh, way over 25 years ago. And um, I, I sat down there and that man taught on being, being a soul winner. And God got a hold of my heart. And I could not wait to get out of that church and go try that out on somebody. The Roman road. Simple little steps. But I want to challenge everybody in here tonight, especially our bus workers. Especially, I look in here tonight and I see people who are soul winners. I can name you people in here that I know personally have won people to the Lord. But Jason, I know he's won souls to the Lord. Uh, uh, Mr. T back there, Miss Judy, uh, Miss Millie, others, a lot of you. I don't, I don't overlook anybody, but uh, Charlie Barlow back there. Raise your hand, Charlie. He's visiting with us tonight. Charlie is a soul winner. He's a soul winner. And I, I know others in here that have actually took your Bible and went to somebody's house, sat down, and told them how to get saved. Now, I'm going to tell you something, people. It's hard to keep your head straight. There's so much junk in the world and so much going on. We forget about the main thing. And the main thing is that me and you can do is keep somebody else from going to hell when they die. People get involved in all kinds of church politics and who's this and who's that and what this church is doing, that church is doing, all that. And the devil does all that just to fog up our minds so that we won't keep our minds on the main thing. And old preacher said this one time. He said, keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is somebody else getting saved and staying out of hell. Like that little girl back there a while ago. Bible said there was rejoicing in the presence of the angel of God when that little girl got saved. You know, when you got saved, that was the greatest day of your life. You know what the second greatest day is? You getting somebody else to get saved. I remember one time. I went to this house. Uh, it was way on the other side of Marion. Somebody called me, said, you need to go witness to this, this uh, lady. I, I forgot. Me and somebody went and witnessed to her. I, 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 I think I remember her first, I think her first name was Patsy. I'm not sure. But it's been years and years ago. And somebody called and said, uh, listen, you need to visit this lady. She had visited our church one or two times. And uh, somebody said, you need to go talk to her. So we went over on Tuesday night, I believe it was. And me and somebody, I started witnessing to this lady. She was probably in her early 20s, and when I started talking to her, she started crying. And I, I could see God getting a hold of her. And you know what she told me? And she said, she said, Danny, she said, I'm scared. She said, every time I start down that street over there where your church is, she said, I won't even go by it. She said, I drive and go around the block, and so I won't have to go by that church. I, and I said, that's the Lord getting a hold of you, honey. I mean, that's God getting a hold of your heart, reaching out there, convicting you. And boy, she got down and got saved. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget it. I remember one time I was over at the flea market in Marion, and we was out giving out tracts, and I was witnessing, and this boy sat down beside me, and he had a British accent. He was from England. His name was Buddy, and uh, uh, his, his hair looked like Ted Nugent or somebody, you know, like that. So he was sort of a overdue, long dong hippie or something. And I, and I said, man, I said, uh, what's going on? I talked to him there for a little bit, and I took him in the Bible. I said, Buddy, here's what you've got to do to be saved. I said, you want to get saved right now? There's where we fail a lot of times. We witness to people, and get them, uh, we don't reel them in. We've got to reel them in. What would you think about a fisherman 
who had good bait, expensive rod, professional fishermen, and threw it out there, and threw it out there, and when a fish got on it, he just sat there. He said, well, he'll jump in the boat when he feels like it. Whenever he wants to, he'll jump in the boat, and I'll eat him. No, he's got to reel him in. So I started reeling old buddy in like that. And man, he got saved right there on the tailgate of my, uh, my truck that I had. And boy, I said, I, we had a time and I prayed with him. He lived down here in Morganton. I come down here and visited him a few times after that. And one night, one night I come down here and got buddy. And it was raining. And, um, I think it was, we went over here. Where was it? We was, I think it was at this tasty freeze over here on, on, on 64. And uh, me and Buddy sat down there, and I got to talking to him. And this really happened. I said, Buddy, I said, Buddy, did you know that uh, if you witness to people, they'll get saved? And I said, who, who knows? You don't ever know. Somebody's liable to walk up to you in heaven one of these days and said, you witness to me, and I got saved. His eyes got about that big, and he said, really? I said, yeah. You never know. You're liable to meet somebody in heaven. And they'll come walking up and say, hey, ain't you, Buddy? He'll say, yeah. Uh, you're the one that talked to me, and I got saved. And I, and about that time, this is no lie, about that time, there's a guy come up and punch me on the shoulder. I turn around and he said, hey, ain't you, ain't you, uh, Danny Castle? I said, maybe. And he said, uh, I, I say, maybe I am, maybe I ain't. Why do you want to know? He said, uh, he said, ain't you Danny Castle? I said, uh, yes, I am. He said, you're a preacher, ain't you? I said, yes, sir, I try to. He said, you picked me up hitchhiking one night in a little old Volkswagen. And he said, me and some boys, it was raining real bad, and you gave us a ride down here, and you talked to us about the Lord. He said, I just want you to know that I went to church that Sunday morning and got saved. I'm telling you, old buddy's eyes got that big around. And to tell you the truth, my eyes got that big around, too. I, I wanted to jump up and shout all the, I wanted to go, whoa! But I didn't want Buddy to think that that was the first time that ever happened. And so I said, see there? See right there? That's what I was telling you, man. It happens every day. And that had never happened before. And, uh, buddy, I tell you, that put me on shouting ground. Since then, I've seen thousands. I've seen thousands. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Thousands of people say, I've seen my, with my two eyes, probably over eight or nine hundred people saved in the last four and a half to five years. And what a joy it is. There is nothing in the world. There is nothing in this world like seeing somebody bow their head and trust the Lord Jesus Christ and come to Him. I want to challenge you tonight. Make up your mind when you go out of this place tonight. I'm going to find me somebody. I'm going to find me somebody. I'm going to find me somebody. There ain't enough devil in hell to stop a soul winning church. If we get our eyes on the Lord and, and, our, and our hearts and our the white fields that are white under harvest, God will give us some souls. He'll give us some souls for our labor. Now, I'm glad we don't, we don't win them all, but thank God we can win some. Amen. I tell you what, boy, oh, we need to give an invitation. We need to give a good invitation. They should be challenged to be saved. Many times people, uh, a lot of times we'll shout and praise God when the town drunk gets saved. Then a little old kid gets saved. We say, oh, well. I had somebody ask me the other day. They said, how many did you have Sunday, preacher? I said, uh, we had about 300. And uh, this has been a couple weeks ago. And they, I said, that's in July. You know, it's the worst time of the year. We're going to shoot back up there in a couple months. And uh, I, he said, how many did you have? And I told him, he said, uh, how many of them was on buses? Boy, it irritates a fire out of me when somebody says that. One man called me one time years ago. He said, how many did you have Sunday, preacher? And I told him we had at that time in Marion, we had, I think we had 1,000, 1,100 that Sunday. He said, but how many of them come in cars? I, th I thought, well, you nut. What difference does it make how they got there? What if they rode a donkey like he did? Amen. He was the donkey. I'm telling you what. Listen, what if they come in a, on, a, on, a, on a horse? What if they rode? Does it not count? If they don't drive in in a big, nice car, you bet your sweetheart it sure counts, brother. It counts to God. God don't look at a Cadillac or an old beat-up bus. He looks at a soul walking in the door. And Jesus died for people who walk in them doors. Churches got, hey, they some churches uh, that, you, that if you don't fit into a certain category, you're not even, don't feel welcome in that church. You have to make a certain income bracket. You have to be in the upper $200,000 per year income and all that. And I'm certainly not against that. I wish we had a bunch of them and, and they would pay their tithe. I wish we did, boy. I got some plans in my head right now. I looked at three places of land this week, but there's one small hindrance and uh, I wish God would send us out. I really do. I wish it. I wish, but I'm ready. We just need the 
the jack. And uh, But I'm going to tell you something, brother. God don't pay attention to that. God looks at a little old snotty-nosed bus kid the same as He looks at a man that owns half of Burke County. And I'm going to tell you this evening, brother. Listen, he that when a soul is wise, it's just as important to God when a little boy, a little girl gets saved as it would be the President of the United States. He that when a soul is wise. Let me challenge it. Bus workers, Junior church workers, Sunday school teachers, let's all get a vision. Let's get a vision. You say, Brother Danny, it's July, and now tomorrow's August. And people don't go. People don't care about church this time of year. Well, there's no vision that people perish. People perish because churches don't have a vision. People perish because church people don't care. People perish because we're so wrapped up in our little world and our own problems, we forget about somebody else that's dying without God. And brother, we need to care and have a vision. Now, you know what? Every church that's ever built, somebody had to have a vision. Every work that's ever somebody had to have it in here. It's in here first, then it works in your head, and then it comes out. Everything I've ever seen, I've built uh, and in charge of several building programs, a bunch of them. And seen a lot of stuff going on, a lot of places. And every time I see it in my heart before you ever see it actually happen. When you walk into a church like this church here tonight, this didn't just happen. It didn't just happen. There's little churches pops up every day. You know where this church started? I was driving up the street out here one day. And in my heart, I've been praying, God. And I had all kinds of advice. Lord, people say this, people say that, people say, take girls, do this, do that, do that, do the other. And I looked up on the sign out there and it said, for lease. And when I saw that sign, so I went, click, right here. And I couldn't get away from it. I memorized that number, 4380042. And I, it, I just looked up there and it stuck in my head. And I went home, prayed about it a couple of days, a couple of days, I called that number. The man said, uh, I want to lease that building, give you a two-year lease. And I said, I can't do that, man. We'll have to flop out after about two months. I'm scared to sign a two-year lease. He said, no, two-year lease flows, I'll go, Danny. And I said, uh, I'll tell you what you do. You let us have it for the first month free. And the second month cheap, <laughs> and the third month cheap, and then the fourth month we'll see what we can do. And he finally agreed to that. And and see, but it starts down in your heart. Bible said where there's no vision, people perish. Where there's no vision, so you got to be able to see. You have to see something before it's there. And anybody who's in business, anybody, a Walmart guy, that stuff just didn't happen. I mean, that guy seen that thing. He wanted a massive department store and have, have a good low, always, always. That's their theme or whatever it is. Always low prices and all that. Man, seen it in his mind before it ever happened. Let me say to our bus workers tonight, we need to have some bus workers that'll have a vision. All you bus captains tonight, get a vision for your bus. Here's what the Lord put on my heart this evening. Now, I'm going to challenge every one of our bus workers. I'm going to challenge every bus worker here tonight and a bunch to you that need to be in the bus ministry. When we started our bus ministry, there's 19 of us met back yonder in, this, in the back uh, room back here. And boy, I remember we met and everybody was so excited about it. Some fizzled out after a week or two. Some fizzled out after a month or two. Let me challenge everybody here. Let's get back in there. You say, well, Brother Danny, I've got stuff to do. So do I. I've got busy on Saturday. So am I. But I tell you what, brother, God gave us some buses out there. Let's make up our mind by by the grace of God, we're going to see those buses full. Don't let the devil tell you people don't come no more. Don't let the devil tell you it can't be done. I'm telling you, it can be done if we'll have a vision. Amen, bus workers? Some asked me before, they said, how'd you get in the bus ministry? I've told some of them before. One night in the old building in New Manor, old building up on the hill there, way before we ever built the new church, I was traveling around a lot and preaching with a lot of preachers and a lot of them preachers didn't even believe in the bus ministry. Some of them said, bless God, that's gimmicks. Bless God, I don't want a bunch of little old brats in here. You ought to get their mom and daddies to bring them. And uh, I had a burden for it. But I thought, what are them other preachers going to say about me if I do this? And one night we all went on visitation. And I can take you to the spot where it happened. Was anybody there with me that night? Linda? Anybody else? I remember coming back, and she's keeping foster kids at that time. And people started telling me that they brought foster kids in, where they're, where they're right down through here, from here right on. They were scalded, where people put them in 
scalding hot bath water, set them kids in that bathtub. And some of them, they held cigarettes on. They had burns all of them where they held little old babies, two and three years old, and held cigarettes on them. And I remember I was set, we were sitting in the floor, and there's a circle of us around like this right here. And it started to tear my heart out. And something inside me said, and you're worried about what some preacher is going to think about you. And God broke my heart. And I said, I jumped up and said, I'll take the bus kids. No, I didn't. That's Jack Hiles. Uh, but I felt it, amen. I felt it. And I jumped up and said, we're going to do it. And that's when the bus ministry started. It had never been done in McDowell County before. A lot of churches have tried it since. But if the preacher ain't got the vision and the people ain't willing to support it, it ain't going to work. As the preacher stopped me in Marion one day, he said, man, how'd you get all them buses? I said, we bought them. He said, well, how'd you get all them kids? I said, you go out all, all day on Saturday and knock your knuckles off on the doors begging them to come. And he said, I want to do that in my church, Danny. How do you do it? And I said, you've got to do three things. I said, number one, you've got to be willing to spend a lot of money. Number two, your preacher's got to be the main man pushing it. And number three, you've got to have a junior church. And if you ain't willing to do them three things and use some promotion, you can forget it. Well, he didn't take my advice. And they went and bought two or three buses. And they tried and they didn't believe in junior church. They didn't believe in giving them popsicle. They didn't believe in giving them a piece of bubble gum. And they, their buses wound up sitting in the parking lot for sale. You know why? He thought, well, I just want to add to my attendance. That's the wrong reason to have a bus ministry. You don't have a bus ministry just so you can add to the attendance. You have a bus ministry because your heart hurts. It hurts when you think about... Listen, y'all, the kids that I bring to church, the one I brought some of them this morning, some of the ones we visit, you would not believe. One of them had surgery this week. She called me and said, You know I had my surgery. I said, Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. What did they do to you? I said, Tell me. I said, What? I said, Tell me. I said, What? She said, Tell me. Ear. She said, they did what? They done something to her ear. And I said, uh, Are you all right? Yeah. And she was hurt because I didn't come see her. And boy, I tell you, if I didn't, uh, the day we was going to camp, I went by there and visited them. And they said, we was wondering where you was at, why you didn't come. Listen, they're out there waiting on you, bus workers. They're waiting on you, bus workers. They're waiting on you, junior church workers. They're waiting on you, Sunday school teachers. Them little boys and girls, they don't have no other way to know about God unless our church and some other churches teach them. Listen. Preacher called me a good friend of mine today. He said, Brother Danny, I don't know what's going to happen in my bus ministry. He said, it's down. I said, well, how's it down to? It's always down this time of year. I've been in bus ministry 27 years, nearly 24 years, or something like that, and it's always down in July. He said, but I don't know what's going to He said, I had to call one of our bus workers today and get them out of bed. I said, are you going to help us today? The man was in the bed. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately. I've been thinking a lot. Somebody called me the other day and they said they had a 14-year-old girl and she slept till 3 o'clock in the day, brother. And I said, what time did she go to bed? She, I said, she went to bed 11 or 12. I said, something wrong with that person. There's something wrong with somebody that can sleep till 3 o'clock in the day. And I'm going to tell you, listen, I'm going to tell you, I, you've heard me say it before, you'll hear me say it again, it's demons, it's demonic power that makes people stay up all night and sleep all day. God didn't make that day to sleep in. He made the night sleep in. Say amen right there. So third shift is of the devil. Amen. Amen. I know. I've worked it before. I know it's the devil. Second shift is too. <laughs> Uh, but listen, uh, brother, I'm going to tell you something. There's something wrong with somebody sleeping. And I, you, you had people this morning that laid in the bed because it was raining. Didn't even get up and come to the house of God. I thought, Lord, have mercy. I hope they never get a job. I mean, can't even be at church by 10 or 11. Get out of bed, man. Get out of bed. Get up. Get up. Get out of bed. It ain't going to kill you. Somebody said, well, I got hey, something wrong when Christians stay up and watch TV till 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning and can't get up and come to church on Sunday. Amen. Say amen. It don't start till 10. You can do a lot of things before 10 o'clock. 
You say, well, I got in the bad lake, preacher. Well, I drove from Florida all night long, me and a couple of boys, and got home at 8.30 on Sunday and took a shower and went to Sunday school. It ain't going to kill you. Your head might hurt, but it ain't going to kill you. Heard about a little girl. One bus worker went and visited a house for five weeks. The mother would always say the kids could ride the bus. But they'd always be asleep. When the bus come, they'd always be asleep. That's a bad thing about summertime. They stay up later and later and later and sleep all day. When school starts, they got to get up. You watch them. they got to get up. It's amazing how when people got to go to work or school, they can get up kids up. When the time to go to church, can't get them out of bed, ain't it? Mm, boy, that gripes a fire out of me. So I'm, you ask them three girls back there. They get up. They've always got up. My girls have never, ever, 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 ever one time said, Daddy, are we going today? They know we're going. When it snows, they know we're going. They know my mom's going to call them for us. Danny, surely you're not going to take them young'uns out on a bad day like this. Mom, you know I'm going to. I've always done it. There ain't no use in fun. But Danny, people understand now. You're going to get one of them hurt. I said, Mom... Thank you. I love you. But you know good and well we're going to church. It's Sunday. Amen? You know, what if one of them? Listen, I've had them girls laying in my office when they were sick because we didn't have nobody to take care of them. And I'd go in there and check on them between Sunday school and preach and say, Y'all right, honey? That's what we used to do when I was little. You know, you've heard me say it before. Say, They'd say, Daddy, I'm sick. I said, Prove it. Throw up. Let's see you throw up right now. I can't throw up. Okay, you ain't sick. If you ain't sick enough to throw up, you're all right to go to church. Ain't that right? And, and, and sometimes they would throw up. You say, what do you do when they throw up? Okay, now you feel better, don't you? Let's get ready and go on to church. Because you feel better after you throw up. <laughs> so either way, man, either way, we've got to drill our... Listen, where there is no vision, people perish. I told you I didn't have a sermon tonight. I'm just talking to you a little bit and encouraging you. Well, this girl said this. Five weeks... Bus worker went and visited the house, and nobody come. Finally, little Bonnie, nine years old, little Bonnie, came one Sunday. Little Bonnie just sat in the service, and there was a lot of visitors that day. To tell you the truth, nobody hardly even noticed her. And at the end of the service, Bonnie came forward and gave her heart to the Lord like that little girl did a few minutes ago. Somebody filled out a little card and put her name down, and it was marked, and they put it in their files. Nobody paid much attention to it. On Tuesday morning, the church telephone rang. Somebody was hysterical on the other end. They said, please let me speak to the preacher. Please let me speak to the pastor. They got him on the phone, and it was Bonnie's mother. Bonnie had went out to the school bus stop that morning, and a driver lost control and killed her. Nine years of age. Sunday she had got saved at church. And that was the only church they knew of. The only church affiliation that family had was that bus worker in that church. The only church they knew was that church that had knocked on their door. Let me tell you something, bus workers. Tra tragedy comes to a family. They think of one church in their mind. The church that knocked on my door. That tried to help me. That tried to witness to me. And the church got together and they helped with Bonnie's funeral. And led mom and dad to the Lord at the funeral home. Bonnie's in heaven tonight because one bus worker went five weeks and knocked on her door. One 13-year-old girl named Nancy got saved. She got the flu and run a high fever, and the night before, uh, she began to swell, and, and she died. The father called. They preached her funeral. And they looked through the church records and found that she had only come a couple of times, about three times, but she got saved. She was baptized and joined the church and moved away. Her father called the church and told them about her dying. Thank God for the faithful bus worker and Sunday school teacher who had led Nancy to the Lord. It's a great work if somebody get a vision. I want our bus workers, every single bus captain here tonight, to look at that board, and when you see your number, say 50. 50. 50. God, give me a vision. I'm going to have 50 on my bus. 
before fall, I'm going to have 50 on my bus. You say, Brother Danny, it can't happen. Oh, yes, it can. There's people in here that will help you, get you a burden, get you a vision. We had a man one time buy us a PlayStation, give away on one bus. We had a man uh, not long ago give a bunch of money to do that. There's people who will help you if you'll get the vision. Fifty on my bus. You got down, you got, like Jack Hyle said, go into a restaurant and sit down, and they'll say, can I help you, sir? And you'll say, fifty. And they'll say, uh, uh, what can I get you to eat? Fifty. A uh, uh, hamburger. Uh, you go home, and, and your wife say, Honey, did you have a good day? And you'll say, Fifty. Uh, yes. Fifty. 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 Where there is no vision, people perish. You know why most churches just have a handful on Sunday night? Because that's all they want. You want, people, you want God to do something bad enough? God will do something. His hand's not shortened. His ear's not heavy. God is still on His throne. And He's able to do just what He always could do. If you'll have a vision. Where there is no vision, people perish. The preacher called me and he said, Brother Danny, he said, uh, Brother Randy Kivett called me. And he said, a man called him this week. A man that he don't even know has no connection with the church. He said, Preacher, do you know there's a city ordinance against parking them buses on that grass? There's a field beside their church and they park their buses out during the week so the people can have the church parking lot. He said there's a law against parking buses on grass. A city ordinance in Charlotte. And Brother Randy said, this guy don't even go to the church. It's none of his business. He said there's a law against that. If you don't move them, I'm going to call the city of Charlotte and have you reported. And Brother Randy said, look, buddy, said, uh, we're just trying to be a blessing to the community. He said, I'll check into it. We're not kind of trying to cause no problems, nothing like that. He said, yeah, but there's a law against it. If you don't move them, I'm going to call the city of Charlotte. He said, we're just trying to be a blessing to the community. Thank you for reminding me. He was nice. He was gentle. He said, there's a law against it. I'm going to call the city of Charlotte. He said, look, buddy, we'll check into it. Thank you for your time. And that guy hung up, and he said, the next day, the city of Charlotte called the church. Now, what would make some old grappy person? I mean, there's drug deals go around there all the time. Randy said the other day, he heard some pow, pow, shots across the street over there in them apartments. People shooting each other. And that guy has tore all the pieces about them buses sitting on that grass. It ain't his grass. It ain't his buses. He don't even live around there. What do you think made that guy do that? That old serpent. The devil hates them buses. He likes them drug dealers. And buddy, I'm telling you what Randy told that guy. He said, if there's a law against it, we'll cross. You know what I told him? I said, go out there and throw your wheelbarrow load of gravel down. Throw a few rocks here and there and say, we graveled it. Shut up. <laughs> Stuff like that drives me crazy, man. What, they're all tore up about buses sitting in gravel. lady called me one time. She said, is this Danny Castle? I said, maybe. She said, you better not send that bus down. It's been ten years ago. She said, don't you send that bus down my road no more. I said, ma'am, who are you? What bus are you talking about? That's why I never would let them put the name on them at New Man. I, because, man, we had some drivers that wasn't safe to be on the highway. But you got to take what you can get. We got one at this church, two or three at this church. One's blind. Got a pacemaker. You got a blind bus driver and a deaf sound man. You're desperate, son. And it's all the same person. <laughs> but I depend on him. He, my, he's my head deacon. I don't know what I'd do without him. Shows you how bad off I am, brother. Now, but listen, she called me and she said, Don't you ever send that bus down here again, man. I said, I don't even know who you I said, Hey, you know it's our bus. Well, they said it is from your church. She said, Knock my mailbox down. I said, God. And I tell you, it was old Gordon. Some of y'all remember old Gordon? Big old Gordon. Lord have mercy. He'd come down through there and turn them buses around just by... <laughs> the first year we was here at our church, we got up one bus and we was all going to go Christmas caroling. You remember that? How many of y'all went with us that first year? <laughs> that was, we all loaded up on the bus to go Christmas caroling. We went into a big fancy place over here in Morton where rich people live. And he backed that bus around there. And we said, come on back, come on back. And these rich, these real rich people had all these fancy Christmas decorations out. And somehow or another they got hooked on the bumper of the bus. 
That's the truth. And we took off and drug every bit of the decoration out in the road, man. Out in the road. It was over yonder where, uh, what was the name of that place? Uh, on 18 South, there's some big housing development up in there. Don't y'all tell nobody. We just, uh, we knocked on the door and nobody came to the door. And we piled them all up and threw them back in their yard and left. All, people ought not to put decorations out there where people have a wreck on them. But somehow or another, they got hooked on the corner of the, the bumper and we drug you $100. We'll get you $100. I ain't kidding you. We'll do it. We'll do it. We want to do this. Get 50 in your brain. 50. Some of you ladies hit the altar tonight and say, you know what? By the grace of God, Saturday morning I'll come and bring them some donuts. I'll do You know, we do that in special. Time, but let's just do it again right in August. You know what? When the devil fights hard, you fight back harder. We don't just lay down and say, oh, well, people don't come to church in the summertime. Brother, we fight back. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. There's people in here that's never been in the bus ministry. You ought to start this week. You don't even have to be a member of the church. The way it's been lately, you don't even have to be saved. God used a, a, a Pharaoh and God used a donkey. Amen. Hallelujah, brother. If Christians won't do it, he'll get sinners to but I want to encourage you tonight, let's get a vision. Let's get a vision. Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Let's stand by our heads for prayer.